Bangalore, a magnet for those on a spiritual pilgrimage. It seems kind of crazy, doesn't it? Heading to the farthest reaches of the world to start my own pilgrimage of sorts. A journey to discover the legacy of the greatest Canadian. But then when a 21-year-old kid from BC first started out on his journey, a lot of people thought he was crazy too. Him and his unbelievable scheme to run clear across the country on one leg to raise money for cancer. You know, I bet they never figured one day you could travel all the way to India and 50 other countries. And this is what you'd see. Heart, guts, a marathon of hope. All in the name of Terry Fox. You can see it in Shamir. He's 10 years old. He's never met a Canadian before, but he's sure heard that name, Terry Fox. Shamir is just one of 4,000 here today for the annual Terry Fox run. Decades after his death, that boy from BC lives on in their footsteps. To them, Terry embodies the most cherished Canadian values, compassion, commitment, perseverance. He is quite simply one of us, an ordinary Canadian who represents the absolute best of who we are, or at least who we hope we might become. There's no one more inspiring, no one we'd rather cheer for, cry for, or run to the end of the earth for, no one greater than the one we grew to love and lost, Terry Fox. You don't see too much out here in the middle of the night. Even on a road that takes you from one end of the country to the other. You'd have to be obsessed to go running at 4.30 in the morning. But back in 1980, that's what Terry Fox did. He ran a marathon a day and we watched. We couldn't wait to catch a glimpse of him at the side of the road. And if we didn't flock to the highway with signs in our hands, we followed his route in the papers, on TV, in our minds. We were haunted by that image that is so achingly familiar. And we still are. Close your eyes. I bet you can still picture it. I know I can. It's become part of our national memory, that image, the lone young man on the side of the Trans-Canada. You can hear it too. It had its own rhythm, its own peculiar poetry. That sound of one leg hopping twice, the other one, fiberglass and metal, swinging forward. And that face, that beautiful open face, no fear. But there was something else in his expression, deep determination in his eyes, pain so tightly wound that when you glance at him, it almost makes you want to look away. It's as if we knew what was coming. I know I might die of cancer, you know, believing in heaven. Is something that will help relieve me of that loneliness. But the thing about Terry is, he wasn't about death and dying, or cancer for that matter. He was all about living. Having two legs, I never hoped for it, I never dreamed of it, because uh, I know 
it's impossible and I know that right now I'm not, I'm probably happier, in fact I know I'm happier than I was before. Self-pity never occurred to him. He wanted people to know there was joy in his journey, not just tragedy, triumph. We've shared in that triumph. Just as cancer touches us all, so does Terry. But what is it about him that brings out the best in us? Or about us that chooses to see the best in him? What is it about him as a man that's led us to create a myth? If you want to define a mythical hero, nobody does it better than the ancient Greeks. For them, a hero is someone who achieves greatness through struggle, someone who takes whatever abilities the gods have given him and works on them, develops them to prepare him for his quest. In other words, for mere mortals to make it in Greek mythology, they have to earn it the hard way. Is there any Canadian who's earned it more than Terry? I don't think so. He faced adversity big time. Leg cut off six inches above the knee. 16 months of chemotherapy. He faced it and decided not only would he beat it, he would do battle for the rest of us too. And the thing is, he was never in it for the glory. I just did what I thought I should do. It was hard for me to understand how I could be a hero. The greatest Canadian was no different than you or me, really. <laughs> he liked basketball and Bobby Orr and peanut butter sandwiches. He was an ordinary guy. Even his mom, Betty, said so. She was a housewife. Dad, Roly, a switchman for the CN Railway. Solid, down-to-earth kind of people. Growing up in the Fox family, there were a few requirements. You had to have manners, and you had to be tough. Tough enough to wrestle with Dad, sometimes till you cried. Terry was tough all right, and bloody stubborn. He could never resist a challenge. Even when he was a little kid, he'd sit in his high chair for hours, stacking one wooden block on top of another. Then he'd have a tantrum when they toppled over. As soon as they were knocked down, he was determined to stack them up again over and over until he had mastered it. If there's one Terry rule of thumb, it's this. Finish what you start, never quit. You know what it's like to be picked last for the team? Humiliating. Terry knew that back in eighth grade. He was a small kid who couldn't quite cut it. The coach challenged him to build up endurance by running. Right here, right here. Yeah. And that's all it took. One thing you should know about Terry is he was really competitive. What he lacked in talent or size, he more than made up for in hard work and sheer willpower. By high school graduation, he was athlete of the year. One of his teammates said he simply outgutted everyone else. Guts, determination. Those are the kind of qualities that serve you well when you need them the most. With a teenager's impatience, Terry wanted to shrug off the searing pain he felt in his right knee, but he couldn't. Osteogenic sarcoma, they told him, a rare kind of bone cancer that tends to target active boys and young men. At 18, they cut off more than half his leg. Imagine, he was 18. Teenagers are all about gangly limbs and awkward moves and self-consciousness. Terry said if there was one thing he hated more than losing his leg, he was losing his hair. Boys on the cusp of manhood aren't supposed to deal with chemo and pain and statistics. Their biggest problem is supposed to be getting a date. They're supposed to be selfish, but that all changed.
It was the children who changed him. As Terry got to know the kids on the cancer ward, he couldn't get their faces out of his mind. His own suffering, he could handle that. But the suffering of others, well, that broke his heart. Kids who were healthy when I started my own treatment actually had died by the time I was finished mine, knowing that there's people in the bed right now who, is not gonna, who might not make it, kids my age and younger. And, and you just can't leave something like that and, try and forget it. And, and uh, I couldn't anyway. I had to try and do something about it. Terry, the teenager not big on self-reflection, began to dream. The unremarkable boy became a man. Somewhere, the hurting must stop. That's what Terry wrote in a letter to the Cancer Society, seeking their blessing for his cross-Canada quest. And so it began, with a dip in cold water and a dream. This afternoon at 2.45, Terry Fox dipped his foot into the waters of the Atlantic Ocean. On April 12, 1980, on the edge of the murky St. John's Harbor, it was far from glamorous. Just a few curious onlookers, one TV camera, and a goal. To raise a dollar for every Canadian and to run 5,300 miles, that's 9,000 kilometers from sea to sea. But before he could start, Terry bent down to touch a pebble. He needed something rock solid, something tangible, to assure himself that his vision, this moment, was real. That's the great thing about Terry. Everything about him was real. It wasn't some impossible teenage pipe dream. It was a quest of a hero. And now he was about to give us all a reason to hope, for real. are timeless. Their accomplishments are so daring and so inspiring, they're remembered forever. For thousands of years, we've been captivated by the legends of ancient Greece, epic tales of strength and sacrifice. One of the greatest tales is not about a god or a mythical figure. It's the story of a man on a mission. A lone runner is on a 26-mile journey from the village of Marathon to Athens. Pheidippides, a simple peasant by birth, is on the biggest mission of his life. He is running to deliver a message of victory by the Athenians over the Persians, a victory achieved against all odds. He's on his way to deliver a message of hope. It was a marathon runner who inspired Terry. The night before his leg was amputated, just three days after his cancer diagnosis, Terry lay in his hospital bed reading a magazine article about the first one-legged runner to complete the New York Marathon. I am a very competitive type person, and I said if he could do it, I could do it too. Terry, the kid who said he rarely remembered his dreams, had a dream that night. He was running right across Canada. He didn't even know if he'd be able to walk, but he was already moving forward. I dream of standing at that last mile in my jogging shorts and saying, here I am. I'm ready to go. I beat it. <laughs> I dream of that. He kept his dream a secret for more than a year. If anyone asked, he told them he was preparing for the Vancouver Marathon. He trained so hard, running 3,000 miles, 
The blood would run down his stump and soak his sock. Remember, according to the ancient Greeks, you don't get to be a hero overnight. Christmas Day was my first day off in 101 days. In that time, I ran with the flu, um, shin splints, bone bruises. You name it, I had it. Three years after they found cancer in his bones, it was time to leave his home in Port Coquitlam. Greatness doesn't usually look this awkward. Someone called it a foxtrot, or a hop, skip, and a jump. Others called it a walk. But the fact is, he was a runner, a great one, pure and simple. Okay, let's face it. Canadians love the underdog. I mean, we'll rave on and on about the hockey player who stays in the game with a broken ankle and shoots and scores. But you know what? That doesn't hold a candle to my guy. Not even close. Terry once said the difference between running on two legs and one was like the difference between walking up a hill and a mountain. Well, he was one hell of a mountain climber. Even from the start, it was an uphill battle. Typical Terry, he didn't choose the easy route. At times, it seemed the wind and rain were conspiring against him. So were the drivers. Blisters, blizzards, exhaustion, expectations. Terry ran through them all. Hot sun, hot tempers. In the long run, none of that mattered. Strength of mind, that's what mattered. It's only up to me and my mind. I know I got a lot of positive attitude and I think I can do it. If you're seeking a personal challenge, this is a good place to start. By its very nature, the marathon defies what we think of as humanly possible. A marathoner's heart slows down but the body temperature heats up, and that can cause nausea, dizziness, even collapse. No doubt about it, it's quite an accomplishment, running 26 miles in one day with two legs. He was running with one. 26 miles, a marathon a day, every day for four months. And though few people knew it, he had a dangerously weak heart. Tough. Terry Fox was tough. He was no spandex weekend warrior. He was a runner with a message. Somewhere the hurting must stop. Maybe that message helped him transcend the pain. All I know is at 4.30 in the morning, I can barely think straight, and a run is definitely out of the question. Believe me, just getting out of bed takes dedication. But this is when Terry liked to get up, after sleeping on a lumpy mattress in a no-name motel. He couldn't wait to get started and head to the exact spot on the side of the highway where he'd stopped the day before. He marked the distance with rocks, and he was adamant, not an inch ahead or back. No cheating. If I missed one mile on the whole run, even a foot, which I have not done, then I think I would ruin what I've done. I would ruin the feeling I have about what I'm doing. And people couldn't trust me, and I don't want that. This was his favorite time of day, when he could run like the wind as much as five miles by 6 a.m., when he could be alone. 
As long as he was raising money, he didn't care who was watching. He wasn't running to be famous. A marathon a day requires energy. Since Terry liked to start early, he was often starving by breakfast. He'd eat a double order of pancakes, maybe a can of beans, and a Coke. Not exactly the breakfast of champions, but it worked for him. You know what didn't work? Endorsements. He had no appetite for making a buck for himself. Only the cause. Corporate Canada was calling, wanting to cash in on this new national hero. But he wasn't in it for personal profit. I love that about him. You were never going to see his gorgeous face on the front of a cereal box. Not like that other great one. <laughs> the leg, on the other hand, it was out there, front and center. He never covered it up. He wanted us to see what a cancer survivor looked like. Think back, nearly 25 years, before every B-list celebrity with a disease went on Oprah. The big C was kept behind closed doors, spoken about in whispers. But Terry took the mystery out of the disease. Cancer was now smack in front of our eyes, panting and sweating on the side of the road. It was raw, unvarnished, and made us a little uncomfortable. But with every step he took, Terry pushed cancer onto our collective consciousness. So, when did it become more than just a run? It's hard to say. There's no rock at the side of the road that measures the moment when goodness becomes greatness. But something had changed. Not in him, in us. We'd seen Terry take his dream and run with it. And now it was our dream too. And he was about to discover he was no longer alone. We were right there beside him. It's hard to resist a parade. It's an excuse to celebrate. We all come together to watch the floats and the marching bands go by. The fire chief shows off the bright new truck. And if the hometown hero appears, we all crane our necks to get a closer look. For a lot of folks, whether he wanted it or not, Terry was that hometown hero. Greeted with curiosity, but also with affection and applause. I think part of it was the spectacle of it all, the chance to watch a parade. People were simply astonished when he ran by, down Main Street, down the highway, past their front porch. You got the nerve, they used to tell him with a smile in Newfoundland. Strangers invited him in for a hot meal and a bath, and they opened their hearts and their wallets, even those who could barely afford it. It meant a lot to Terry, especially the kids. After he was serenaded by the choir at All Hallows School in Cornerbrook, he told them not to feel sorry for him, that having an artificial leg wasn't so bad after all. He didn't know it then, but they donated all their recess money to the Marathon of Hope. Thank you, Lord, for giving us hope right where we are. Pain didn't make him cry, but they did. Terry was deeply moved by the sight of 10-year-old Greg Scott, who had also lost a leg to cancer. I'm crying now because I, there's somebody here right now who is going through the same thing that I went through. The exact same thing, and he's only 10 years old. 
And I, I had the most inspirational uh, day of my life today. When I was a little girl, I was totally captivated by the boy who ran on the nightly news. All of us kids were. We'd run around the backyard and pretend we were Terry. You know what? I think that's part of his greatness. He was one of the crowd, one of us. Your brother, your son, the high school quarterback, or the pimply guy in the corner. We can all get cancer. Every spin a winner. If Terry could battle cancer with courage, maybe we would too. If he could be a hero, fact is, back in the spring of 1980, we were on the lookout for heroes. The country was consumed by political squabbling with the referendum and a recession on the horizon. Terry was above politics. It's not that he didn't care. In his eyes, Quebec was an integral piece of the fabric of our country. Maybe it takes a truly great Canadian to understand that the Trans-Canada doesn't have a language barrier, and neither does cancer. In early July, he ran into the nation's capital like a breath of fresh air. Remember the lonely runner at the side of the road? Not anymore. Wow, that was great. <laughs> she makes it easier to run when those people are clapping for you running down the road. Wow. <laughs> By the time Terry got to Toronto, people came from all over southern Ontario just to catch a glimpse of him. One of his own heroes, hockey star Daryl Sittler, ran alongside him all the way to City Hall. There were 10,000 people, and they couldn't get enough of him. I never treated him like before. <laughs> he never traveled in a limousine. He thought it was kind of pretentious. But there were groupies, and you can understand why. Those looks, those classic Greek god kind of looks, those golden brown curls, and oh, that smile. But he didn't have time for girls or romance. He was too busy running. With Toronto behind him, there was still half a country to go. He'd been avoiding doctors all along. But now there was this nagging cough that wouldn't go away. Reporters had already noticed the blood leaking down his leg. Some thought he was obsessed to the point of danger and urged him to quit. Even calling him a three-legged horse who should be stopped. Not Terry. People tell me that I'm hurting myself. They don't understand that. You only live once, and if you want to get something done, you got to do it while you get the chance. Times when I've broken down because I've been so fatigued, but I always know I can keep going. I know tomorrow morning I'll get up and go again. By the time he got to Thunder Bay, he had gone through eight running shoes and 3,339 miles. Yesterday I was running and I had noticed a little bit of hardness in breathing. I was coughing and choking, and I decided I had to go see the doctor. And it was discovered then that uh, I had primary 
Originally, I had primary cancer in my knee three and a half years ago, and uh, that the cancer had spread, and now I've got cancer in my lungs, and uh, we got to go home and tr and try and do some more treatment, but. Uh, All I can say is that if there's any way I can get out there again and finish it, I will. It was heart-wrenching to watch. Now Terry and the rest of us had to accept that even heroes are human, with all the frailty that entails. But along the way, he taught us a thing or two about the courage of conviction. And now he was about to inspire the world. It starts with a ripple, a simple idea that catches a wave and spreads until it reaches right across the ocean. Terry Fox was going to run all the way from the Atlantic to the Pacific. To dip his foot in the water here on Vancouver Island where the highway comes to an end. He didn't quite get this far, but his dream sure did. When he returned to BC, it was to enter the hospital. The cancer had spread to both lungs. Bitter? No, I know I don't feel bitter. I, um, like I'm not surprised by anything anymore and uh, this, is, this is the way life is. I'm not the only one who uh, is in this situation. There are people in a lot worse situation. I did my very best and I'm not upset that I didn't make it. And if there's any way I can finish it off next year or the year after, I'll be there. But as he got weaker, we got stronger. The country rallied to his cause, and the money started pouring in. And now, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Terry Fox. His dream was a dollar for every Canadian. We surpassed it. By February 1981, the Terry Fox Marathon of Hope had raised more than $24 million. A fundraising success that made it into the Guinness Book of World Records. From CEOs to the boy who sent in his booty from the Tooth Fairy, that crazy dream inspired us all. To receive the insignia of a companion of the Order of Canada. Terry was too weak to travel across the country. So the Governor General flew to BC and awarded him the Order of Canada. He was the youngest recipient ever. brave soul that took the long and painful road and helped create a dream that could not fail. That's you. Thank you very much. Terry once said that cancer forced him to prove that he was worthy of life. But the guy who had shown us the way the driving force behind the search for a cure. He was never gonna benefit from his own extraordinary effort. 26 miles, an arduous journey, but a lone runner, Pheidippides, has finally arrived in Athens. Rejoice, we have won, he declares. Then, according to legend, he collapses of exhaustion and dies. Terry has completed the last kilometer of his marathon. He died surrounded by love. The love of his family and the love and prayers of the entire nation. Well, he was a very brave 
boy, I must say, you know, feel very, very sad about it. Whatever he's done has been for others. It, it's, it just doesn't seem just somehow. You gonna miss him, Sean? Yes. Don't cry, love. It's all right. Don't cry, sweetie. It's all right. Truly, it is. It's all right. We are deeply conscious of the debt of gratitude we all owe to this remarkable young man for the gift of his boundless courage and perseverance, the gift of a life which inspired the country he loved. We lost him, but he's everywhere. Just like the highway that carried him from one corner of the country through four months and six provinces, Terry still connects us. Triumph, not tragedy. We have to remind ourselves of that sometimes. Remember the joy in his journey when we think about Terry's run. That journey took him further than he'd ever imagined. Clear across the ocean. All the way to India. Terry didn't live long enough to travel to faraway places, but he's here now in Bangalore and everywhere else in the world where there's been a Terry Fox run. 50 countries, including China, Zimbabwe, Oman. He's one of the few great Canadians whose legacy reaches far beyond our borders. Only a few more miles to go. Young, old, it's amazing how Terry's brought them all together. There's no trophy. That's how Terry wanted it. His marathon was never about winning. He wanted to make sure that even the youngest and the weakest could look up and see the finish line and believe they could make a difference. $350 million worth of difference. That's how much we've raised in Terry's name. Most of it right here in Canada. Our top oncologists say that without his Marathon of Hope, we simply wouldn't have been able to invest in the kind of research that is now saving lives. Just ask Kelly. He did his very first Terry Fox run in a wheelchair. Now, this 13-year-old can walk six miles. Kelly's leg was amputated when he was only seven osteogenic sarcoma, the exact same kind of tumor as Terry. So Kelly. Except there is one big difference. There's no cancer in Kelly's lungs, no sign of it anyway. Back in 1980, the survival rate for Terry's kind of bone cancer was only 15%. Today, more than 75% are cured, just like Kelly. He's a living, breathing, sweating example of Terry Fox's legacy. It just doesn't get any better than that. I'm not in search of the man or the myth anymore. I think I knew it all along. Terry Fox is the greatest Canadian, not just because of who he was or what he did, but because of how he's reflected in us. He inspired us to be the best we can be. We walk in his footsteps each time a scientist makes a new discovery, and each time we show compassion. And through us, he's made it all the way here, right to the end of the highway from sea to sea. He never stopped running, after all.
there can only be one winner, Frederick Banting. Frederick Banting had the most important discovery in modern medical history, insulin. And such a tiny head for such a big idea. They put him on the cover of Time magazine. Frederick Benting, the greatest Canadian who ever lived. <laughs>